Hello everyone, my name is Phil Calvert and a very warm welcome to the Financial Advisor Mastermind and Challenge. Throughout this week, advisors, leading experts and consultants to the financial planning profession are sharing amazing insights into just what makes a world-class financial advice business. Today I'm delighted to be speaking with someone who's an internationally renowned former sprint, hurdling and track and field athlete. He has three European Championship gold medals to his name. He has gold, silver and bronze medals from the World Championships, silver and bronze medals from the Olympic Games and a gold medal from the 1990 Commonwealth Championships. Please welcome Mr. Chris Akabusi, MBE. How are you, Chris? Fantastic. What a write-up. Thank you very much, Phil. Well, it's great to see you, Chris. Uh, I've uh, had to go out for a run this morning. I've done some sprints down the road to get my energy levels up to as close as I can get to your bar. Well, I've got to admit, Phil, you look a lot healthier today than I met you 10 years ago. So <laughs> you're obviously doing something right, I've got to admit. Thank you very much. Well, uh, I, I used to loathe running, but I got into yoga and kickboxing uh, in a big way. And, uh, you know, d I, you know more about this than anybody else. About It's about how you feel at the beginning of the day as much as anything, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, the start sets up the rest of the day. I mean, they do say it's not how you start, it's how you finish that matters. But actually, if you have a good start, you're more likely going to have a better finish. So certainly for me, I do start my days, most days of the week, with a, a little run and a seven-minute circuit. So my first hour of the day is involved with running, circuit training. And I don't want to say mindfulness, because I think it's got a little bit of overuse now, but certainly a sort of a, a deep introspection, a, a deep time with myself. Yeah. Asking myself, who do I want to be today? And that might sound like a, an obtuse question, like, who do you want to be? I want to be myself. But, you know, we, we, we do wake up with different emotions and different flavours to ourselves. And it's important that we get into the habit of choosing the self we want to be today. You know, the, the emotional self, the introspective self, the uh, inquisitive self, the curious self. The, the, the motivational self. Who do I want to be to say? They say it's more important to get outside of the right side of their head than it is the right side of the bed. Yeah, that's a good one. I like I like that one. I know uh, Tony Robbins. Uh, he's often said that he spends the first 15, 20 minutes of the day going through. I think he calls it a priming exercise using visualization techniques. I, I know some people would think, well, that's a bit woo woo, but uh, it, it's important, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not as um, regimented as that. You know, I, I get up. I mean, I'm, I'm 60 now, and at 60, I can't utilize my body the way that I did at 20. At 20, boom, get up and go, yo, let's go. You know, and you can afford to dissipate and waste your energy when you're 20 because you've got it bountifully. But at 60, I'm still strong. I, I, I'm still engaging but I have to use it propitiously you know I know I haven't got it to waste and I want to be effective and efficient when I'm meeting my customer when I'm meeting my client when I'm meeting the public when I'm engaging with what the things that I love with my thinking and my interactions I want to be really fit for purpose and so I need to make sure that the energy I'm going to use I use with vitality so don't waste it so it's really good go up do a little run do a little circuit, do a little bit of internal deep cleansing, boom, let's get jiggy with it. And away we go, yeah. Chris, I'd love to just get a little bit into your backstory um, and to take you back to Los Angeles in 1984, um, which I've heard you describe as um, a foundational moment for you. Can you just talk us through that and tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I think we need to go back a little bit further than that even because I was born and bred in London. My parents come from Nigeria. They went back to Nigeria when I was four and I didn't see my parents again until I was 12. I was brought up in a children's home and at 12 years of age in the children's home, I finally realised my mother wasn't coming and the reason that's important because in facing that limit situation, in facing that reality, I had to decide right there and then 
that I was going to be enough, that I wasn't going to die. I was going to make something of myself. So I took responsibility for my life at 12. I decided to play the clown at school. And that, that, I achieved that very, very well. I got people laughing at me, et cetera, et cetera. But the only problem was I left with zero qualifications. So at six and a half, I was qualified not to do very much. I had to leave the children's home. And so then I made another important decision, and that was to join the army. In joining the army, I met somebody that was very important to me. His name is Sergeant Ian McKenzie. And he was the very first person that came into my life that identified some potential in me. And that was that I might not be the brightest spark in the world, but I could run fast. And he sort of got me into training in an athletic development training program. And then fast forward from Sergeant McKenzie at 16 to being 24 and standing in Los Angeles representing the country at the Olympic Games. And it's a sight, and funny enough, I, you, 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 you didn't ask me this, but as ever, if you know me, I, you know, I've got it here. I carry this with me everywhere. Yeah. And it, is, it is my talisman, but the Germans call it a Denkmal. And Denkmal means to think, pause, hold and reflect. A Denkmal. And it allows me to Denken, to think, and to hold on to the fact that I can achieve, that if I, if I dream big, take massive action, tell people about what it is I'm trying to achieve, the right people come into your life in order, in order to support their dream and your dream. And that's the story of the 1994 Olympic Games. It was a dream come true. It was a snotty kid from the children's home. It was nine no levels. It was going into the army for safety and security, place to belong, to meeting my mentor, my manager, trans transformation in my life, to standing in the Olympic arena in 1984 with three other guys and really being no hopers, yet bonding together, working hard, and to completing our dream. Todd Bennett, Phil Brown, Gary Cook, and myself became Olympic silver medalists in 1984, and that was me jettisoned into the world of track and field athletics. And it's a very important moment. I know if I can achieve then, I can achieve any time. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's fantastic. So is it, is it fair to say then that, I mean, a lot of people think there must be some kind of difference between people like you and people like me, people like and regular folk. Are you, are you saying that anybody, given the right circumstances, can achieve great things? I do believe that each and every one of us is born with a capacity and a basket of skills to serve humanity in a way that nobody else can. It's really important in this journey, this wonderful sojourn in life, this three score years and 10 if we're lucky, maybe 20 and 30 if we're really gonna push the boat, that we, we, we interface with this conscious awareness and experience we call life. Mm -hmm. And we are unique and we are wonderfully created or thrown into the world. And you've got some gifts, talents, skills and abilities that are unique to you in this time frame continuum. We are here today and we are gone tomorrow. And there are many people been before us and there are many people who come after us. But we are here and we are here amongst other people. And it's really important and material to find out what your gift is. And if I think about the demographic that we're talking to and you found your way into financial accounting, independent advising, a community building, collaboration, unique ideas around how to manage your wealth. You need to find out how you do that well. And this is your calling. Now, I know a calling's got a sort of a religious context to it, and I've got a religious background, but when I say calling, I'm talking about that call from the world, that call from the universe, whatever it is that we see here in this world. The universe calls us to be the best that we can possibly be. I don't know if there's a hereafter. I don't know if we, if we slip over the Rubicon into oblivion or we transcend into some sort of eternal hereafter. But what I do know is I'm here. 
I'm here with you and I'm here with everybody that's listening. And while I'm here, I want to be the best example of who this hologram is. I want to stand out and be great. And we can all stand out and be great. We can be unique. You can't be me. I can't be you. But you can be the best you can possibly be. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Now, like a lot of um, athletes that have that have really achieved a, a high level, you've um, moved on to doing other things. You work in TV. Uh, you have the Akabusi company. Uh, you speak all over the place. I'm, I'm often being fascinated by this, that after you've devoted your life to such high levels of excellence, often for many, many years, although it can often seem it's gone by in a flash, you've worked at high level for many, many years, and then it's all changed. How do you cope with that? And, and just to kind of follow up on that, a lot of our financial advisors that are watching this um, are nearing retirement. They've had quite successful careers. Uh, and I would imagine for one or two of them, they're thinking actually putting their feet up isn't really an option, but there's a lot of, there's a lot going on up here about how do I cope with this period of change? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Phil. So I, in another sphere, I'm like your IFAs, you IFAs, you guys, you here, listening right here, I'm like you. I'm 60 and 60 is a big, big birthday. And I've had 40 years of really pushing out there and, 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 and magnifying myself and contributing to the community, being an asset, not a liability. But all, I've lived a lot of my time in my body, a physical uh, specimen, an example. And but, but what I'm now realizing is these glasses tell you my eyes are failing. You can't hear, but my, my ear is not what it used to be. My children come to my house and they turn on the TV. Papa, are you deaf? Not quite, but I like the TV loud so I can hear what they're saying. I've had a serious operation, lost half of my colon. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. You, you are right. You come to a stage in life to say, okay, what next? I don't want to be what I used to be. I want to be now what I can be. I, I, I don't need to be operating at the highest level, but I want to be operating at my highest level. And so this is the time to ask yourself, money, no object, success guaranteed, you couldn't fail, what would you do now? Are there things that you thought of doing when you were eight, nine, 10, 12, 14, that got jettisoned to the I've not got the time, I've not got the money, I've not got the confidence to do, or the inclination, because I've got to get on earning money, I've got to get on with it. Are there things there that you were passionate about, engaged with, were good at? Like, are there things there that people said, oh, you know, when you do that, I feel your passion, I feel your energy. Are there things there that you can rekindle? Are there things there that you can develop? Maybe this time it's not all about making money. Maybe it is about making money. I mean, I, I, I love money. Money is an expediter. Money helps me um, create opportunities for other people. Money helps me keep my family uh, um, comfortable. Money helps me not be poor. And one of the best things you can do for the poor is not be poor yourself. So you know, I've got nothing against money, mm. but money is not the be all and end all. So what is it about me for personally? I decided I want to go back to studying and, and, and I'm back in education. I'm doing a master's in existential, existential philosophy and psychotherapy because I know when I was a kid, that's what people used to say to me. You know, for somebody so young, you've got great insights. Oh, I, I like talking to you, Chris, because you've got an ability to listen. Well, no one's ever asked me that question before. Where did that come from? But these are sort of things that I consigned to the back burner because I had to get on soldiering, had to get on being a sportsman. Had to get, in, get on being a business speaker and earning money. But now at 60, I'm really engaged with that philosophy. I'm really engaged with living the examined life. Now, nobody can pay me for that. In fact, I'm paying for it. But actually, it's, it's, it's giving me a excitement and a, a viscosity, a, a, a substance, texture to this life of mine. I'm living a life that I've never lived before, and a, a, a vibrancy that I've never lived before. Yeah. And that's what you do if you're prepared to let go of the past in order to move forward to your preferred future. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. It's, it's a, people often talk about uh, reaching their full potential, and you certainly reached your full potential, but you're now going at another type of full potential, aren't you? You've, no one could accuse you of, of 
sitting back with your feet up. Uh, you are fascinated by continuous personal development. It's, it's really important to you, isn't it? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very curious about this thing called life. I don't take it for granted. You know, I'm supposed to be a motivation speaker, but at the forefront of my mind is I'm going to be dead soon. And when I say soon, it's all relative. I could be dead in the next 30 years if I'm lucky, 10 years if I'm unlucky. Well, 10 years is about right, 70 years I can't complain. But I'm going to be dead. And so before then, I want to apprehend all the stuff that's there for me. And so I don't take it for granted. I think it's very easy to take it for granted. Although I do believe when you get to 60, if you are a thinking person, you get to where I'm at now. Now, and I was saying to somebody else this morning, you know, I've taken my health for granted. That doesn't mean I've not worked it, you know, I've worked very hard and, you know, I've ate the right stuff and I do exercises, but really I've taken it for granted. You know, I've, you know, I've not really, really thought I'm going to be ill or I'm going to die and all that sort of stuff. And then I've had a couple of things that's happened to me and a couple of things to look around and I realised this is no dress rehearsal. Now, how many times have you heard that? Mm. Life is no dress rehearsal. And it just rolls off the tongue. But, mate, it's true. Yeah, it's yeah. True for you. And one of the guys I'm reading a lot of at the moment is a guy called Heidegger. Now, Heidegger didn't cover himself in glory. He was, uh, he's a great philosopher. He's also a Nazi. Uh, so he didn't cover himself in glory, but he's a great philosopher in the 20th century. And he talked about living toward death. And what he meant by that was living in the light of your own death, of really holding up death as a mirror to your life and looking at it and let it speak to you and asking you before it comes hurtling into your peripheral vision and then over you, what are you going to be? What are you going to do? When I'm asked to define what success is, I define success as the life you lead, the lessons you learn and the legacy you leave. The life you lead, the lessons you learn and the legacy you leave. Yeah. If that is success, what is your legacy going to be? And right now, at this age, 60, especially us, late baby boomer, we are the guy with all the resources. We are the guys who've invested in our homes and seen it grow exponentially. We are the guys who've seen us as outstrip our forefathers exponentially as far as wealth creation is concerned. If we can't live the exam in life, no one can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I love that. The, uh, the financial advisors that aren't retiring, there's a lot of focus today on high standards, quality, um, which goes without saying is, is a central ingredient in, in any team and in any personal development as well. What would you say and, and, and what advice would you give to people who are looking to strengthen their team? And it could be financial advisors, para planners, support people, anybody in, in a business. What makes a great team in a, in a business, do you think? Well, okay. Before I talk about that team, I'm going to come back straight back to it. But what I would say to anybody who's working as an adventure, a, a financial advisor or any sort of relationship which involves people, the most important thing is you build trust, that, that your customer and client builds trust. I, you build trust with your customer and client. Um, because, and I've got a financial advisor, you don't have to be perfect as a financial advisor. You don't have to get it right every time. You don't have to be the front of all knowledge and wisdom. But what you do have to do is give me a sense that you're in it for me. Give me a sense that you are, 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 are well-skilled, that you've earned the right to be where you are, that you are reliable, someone that I can rely on to, 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 to be, be there for me when I need you, and have the relation to say, I've got it wrong when you've got it wrong. So it's really important when we start talking about you, I will forgive you a multitude of sins if I trust you. So standards are important quite clearly. You have to have standards. I'll go into that in a minute. But Trust is the key ingredient in a relationship. My finance advisor's got a few things wrong, uh, but, but because I trust him, because I believe it's, he's there for me and not for him, and I believe that, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter, I believe that I sense that, I invite him to my, you know, I invite him to things like my 60th birthday party, he was there, I invite him to my daughter's wedding, he was there, that's the sort of relationship I've got with him, yeah. I trust him, so that when he gets it wrong, 
I can shake him around and say, I know you did it right for me, Trevor. I know you did it with the best intentions in, in, in your mind. And that's all that matters. Okay. When it comes to teamwork, it's really important that I think teamwork, that you know what your role is in the team. That you know, if you talk about athletics and you talk about relay running, we've all got a different leg and each leg has got a different way of being. And you are best suited for that particular leg. So what's your leg in my team? What, 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 what is your role in my team? Mm. Now, for me, initially, when I first met my financial advisor, it was about safety and security. It's about making sure that he invested my money in the right places that I didn't lose it because I couldn't afford to lose any money. So, you know, I, I, was, I was risk averse. Mm. So, it's, okay, you make, you're making a few bob in athletics. How do we ensure that you've got a bit saved back for you when you retire? But then, as I got a little bit more wealthy, and I'm, and I'm a million miles from being Rockefeller, yeah, but then it's, you can get a little bit more creative. And you can look at um, developing assets. You can look at a property portfolio, for example. You can look at um, investing in, in things more than ISAs. You know, look at, at getting better yields. And so that's really important. And I'm not talking about... So, so I'm back to trust again, aren't I? I'm not, I'm not really talking about standards. You asked me about standards. Um, so what can I say about standards? When you, is there anything specific you're thinking about, Phil? When you do the no, I just think quality. I mean, to, to be in a team that you were in, okay. um, there, yeah. has, there has to be quality standards in there, yeah. um, which it's easy to talk about it, but to actually achieve it is hard, isn't it? Yeah. Well, well, well I mean, the sort of standards that... So in the teams that I w were in, if I, if I take athletics, because it's... It would, hmm. I knew for sure that whether I was with you or not, I know you, Phil, are training. Right. You are training really, really hard to ensure that when we get together in the summer, you are at the top of your game. So one standard is, are you keeping abreast of CPD, continued professional development? Are you at the cutting edge? Have you got that standard that nothing goes past your desk that you don't know? There's no athlete in the world that doesn't train with the best people possible. I went and trained in California. In California, I trained with Edwin Moses. For those of you, if you're my age group, Edwin Moses, Daley Thompson, Roger Black, John Regis. I trained with the very best guys. So are you, that's one standard. Right. Keep up the best training. Another standard, putting it on the line. I've met a load of guys who love all the training, they love to go into venues, love to be seen at the right places, but they're really, they're really scared to put it on the line. Right. Are you prepared to make the hard shots? Have you got that standard that says, I make the hard shots, the big shots. I do take calculated risks, but I go with my gut feeling and I win more than I lose. I don't want you taking risks when you're a loser, mate. No, you're no good for me. But I want to say the calculated risks, but you go, you, you dare go where others don't. Because you see those guys at Olympic finals, they go places where other people don't go. They take risks. They go on the line when, not, when they're not 100%, when they've got a little niggle, but they go to the line. Yeah. And they go to the line. Have you, have you, have you got that sort of, I'm going to take the calculated risk. And I'm going to dare to be measured by other people. Are you dare to be measured? Can you be measured? Can you, are, you, are you happy to go out there and look at my portfolio and look at what I do against, your, against the rest of your mates, against the rest of your stable? So they're the sort of things that we do. Standards. Here's one of the standards. If you say you're going to go training or you're going to go competing, do you turn up on time each time, every time? Five, not five minutes late, not half an hour late. Now, I'm sure, I am sure the people that are watching this say, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, we will do that. Yeah, that's why you're good at what you do. Mm. Because, because, you know, you, you, you don't turn up late, you turn up half an hour before him. Now, in my private life, I'm always late. And the people that, in my private life, say, how do you run a business? <laughs> well, because in, in my private life, I, you know, I'm always squeezing things in. But in my business life, I'm on time. Mm. I'm on time. I'm half an hour before and I'm prepared for the engagement. Because you know what? In athletics, 
the Olympic final, they don't go, hold on, Akabuzi's just getting off the bus. Can we all just wait, please? A gun goes bang, you missed your slot. Yeah. At conference, they don't go, hold on, sit in your seats, Akabuzi's just coming into the conference hall, he's going to take 15 minutes. Oh, Akabuzi's off, somebody else is on. So you've got to make sure that you, you do what you say on the, on the tin. You deliver each time and every time. That's interesting. I've heard you also talk about um, this fundamental belief that the the sum of the team is is always going to be stronger than any one individual. I'm sure I messed that up, but tell okay. us what you mean by that. Yeah, the team is always getting the sum of its parts. But what I mean by this is, so if you've got a team around you, and often what happens when you are a top-notch IFA, you are the expert, you've got the je ne sais quoi, You've got the magic hands. You've got a turn of phrase. You've got a way of engaging with people that gets them believing in you and your service and your delivery. And, we, and, and you build something and pretty quickly you realise that there's stuff that you can't do. You can't do your marketing. You can't do your administration. You can't do... When I say you can't do your finance, you can't do your own bookkeeping. <laughs> because, you know, you're now generating a size of income, six-figure sum, million two three four million ten million pound practice whatever it is now what i say it's really important to employ the right people around you that are better at their segment of the market than you are and allow them to get on and do it and 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 respect them as much as you want them to respect you yeah. I mean, it's not what I say, but when I say there's no point buying a dog and barking yourself, it's not that the people in your team are dogs, but the idea is a dog is an expert at barking and defending and letting you know that something's there. So let's what? If I've got myself a dog, I'm not doing in the barking, I'm not going to do, do the defending or let people know I'm there. You yeah. do that, I'm going to do my job. That is vitally important. Again, in athletic parlance, I was a guy, there was nobody in my team that could run around a track and jump lumps of wood like I could. That's why I was number three in the world and best in Europe, right? But my physio was better than me at physiotherapy. Yeah. My trainer was better than me than watching my technique and seeing when I was beginning to have a, sm a, sl a slight deficit or a breakdown. My training partners were better than me at getting me back onto the line when I needed to go to, to the next rep. And I think you get the picture. You yeah. surround yourself with world-class people who are better than you at that aspect of your business. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's take you to Tokyo. Was it 1991? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to me, the 4x400 relay, it, you talk about risk. <laughs> that's the one where you're watching it on the TV or from the stand. You go, oh, anything can go wrong in this, yeah. and, it, and it does. So there you are. There's Roger, there's Derek, there's John. And you're doing the, the final leg as well. Um, you're sitting behind Pettigrew there, Pettigrew there. I mean, when I'm watching that, I'm thinking, I could see it in your body that you knew you were going to take him. Is that what you felt at the time? Um, that, that's such a magnificent race, time of my life. I'm so grateful that I had the privilege to be in my, my body at that time. You know, that, that, that I experienced it, that I had that stick. That I was given the responsibility to that last leg. It was just great. Sometimes, you know, you have dreams and fantasies and every now and again they do come true. And that was the day when it came true. And it, it was really because we had the right team. You know, we decided the night before to, to, to change the order around and Roger Black was our best man. And normally in a relay team, your best man goes last. But we decided that we needed to put our best guy first and the only other quarter mile a second, Derek Redmond, in order to give ourselves a chance to be up there with the Americans. Because we looked into history, we saw that the main reason the Americans hadn't been defeated was because over time what had happened is that the Americans had got such a massive database of, of quality quarter milers that on the first leg, they'd open up six or seven metres against the rest of the world. Second leg, two or three more. Three legs, three metres clear, uh, seven metres, 50 metres clear. And that was unassailable. Mm. And so when we did it and we changed it around and we agreed and we were all on the same page, it's just great to be, and if I say a bunch of men, it's because these were men, but a bunch of people, it's great to be on the same page as a bunch of people and to look people in the eye and know that these guys are in it with you 
for you and about delivering in this arena. What I call a unifying dream and an organising principle. We had the organising principle and that was the way we were going to organise ourselves in order to deliver. And the unifying dream was to beat the Americans and to be number one in the world. And I saw when Roger got that stick and he is at the first leg and he, he goes rushing off and he, he runs in his Bambi style and you can see him with all that aggression. And it's, and it's forward lean, and he presents a stick to Derek, and we're actually in the lead with Roger. And that's the first time that we'd ever been in the lead of the Mighty Americans. He hands it over to Roger, Roger uh, to Derek, sorry. And Derek's the only other quarter miler. He gets that stick, and Derek takes the risk. He goes eyeballs out, gets in front of the American before the turn, because there's a little in the first turn. Everyone breaks out of the lane and into the court, court, concertina, and he tries to hold that bend and make Quincy Watts run outside the Ben, he comes into the home straight. Now Derek is fighting to hold on with brute strength and, 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 and sheer determination. And he hands over the bat and level pegging with the mighty Americans. Then John Regis gets the um, baton on the third leg. Now what you need to know about John, John was a 200 meter runner. And what we had said to John is that John, unless you can give back a piece of 10 meter lead, you've got to tuck in on the drop step of the American and stay on the tail. And this is why, if you know anything about cycling, you know about the peloton effect and that actually, that, that if you can get in the leeway of somebody, they break the wind and, and the, they create a little buffering zone. And in the lee side, there's a coefficient, coefficient, coefficient drag factor that allows you to get a little lift, lift around. And actually, you can run quicker with less, less effort being on a drop strap. And so I didn't want to be on the last leg facing the world champion and be two or three metres ahead of him because he'd have chewed me up. 10 metres and I could have done him, or five minutes I might have been done him, but not two or three. So John hands over the baton and we're on the drop stop of the Americans. And you see, this is where the commentator gets you wrong because the, the, com the commentator thinks that we're going to lose now because John has not been able to maintain the lead. But John did it ex absolutely smack on. In fact, for me, John was the most influential and important leg of that race because John's a 200 meter runner and he's not used to running 400s and often what you see with 200 meter runners when they have to run 400s they get they run like a started rabbit but, and, and they use all of their energy and then they die a death but he under the, the stress and duress was able to understand and remember the strategy and anybody here running a business you know that strategies or businesses don't fail because they've got they haven't got a strategy no they have a strategy they fail because it's not implemented. And it would have been so easy for John Ridge right. not to implement the strategy. He right. implements the strategy. He gives me the stick. I get after, I get after Pettigrew. I'm going down the back straight and I'm so stoked. I'm now, the word enthusiasm is a Greek word. And it means as inspired by a God. En theos, theo, in God. In breathed, inspired as a God. I was so enthusiastic. I was large. I was double my size. I felt phenomenal. I was going down the back straight. I was looking at the American. I thought we were jogging. I wanted to say, Pedigree, bib, bib, bib. Come on, we're jogging. I don't want to blow past, but come on. But I look up and there's a big screen. I can see everybody else with miles behind. They're 15 minutes behind. So I say, Akabuzi, calm down, son. Don't do yourself. Don't do yourself. So I hang on down the back straight. I bet I've a second bend into the home straight. I see the line, I indicate right, I go past him, I get past him, I'm open up a gap, then all of a sudden the flu of the of the of the baton. Ooh, ooh, he's coming back. I throw myself across the line and it's amazing. We are champion de monde. We are champions of the world. It was a phenomenal moment, and that was a great example of the team as a whole as great in the sum of its individual parts. Fantastic. And you were feeding off each other then. 100%. Yeah. 100%. When we were, when, when the way it goes, we, the, 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 the runners to go are all put in a pen when the first guy's running, second guy's running, third guy's running. And I, we were just so excited. I mean, when I say excited, it's, this is internalised. You can see it in the eyes. You can see it in your veins. You can see it in your skin. You can see these guys are focused. But I tell you what, my belief in the guys was 100%. Mm. Guys, I love these guys. I love these guys. I looked at Roger, Derek, and, and John. I love these guys. We were going to go into the arena, and we were bonded together. 
It was us against the rest of the world. And we were, we were ready. And you see, you see um, Roger go off. And Roger does the job. Oh, gosh, it's amazing. And on oh, Derek gets a stick. He's doing the job. It's amazing. And then John gets it. And we're exhilarated. And now John can come and I can see him. I'm telling you, I am buzzing. There's no greater place than being with four guys and being on the same base pace and you are buzzing. Yeah, I think it's worth saying too for people who, who don't know, Pettigrew, who you overtook, uh, had already won, he was already the champion, wasn't he? Uh, previously. Individual. Yeah, he was, he, he was the individual 400, so he, he won the 400 in those championships. Yeah. But I've got to be fair to him, he was put in an in impossible position. He is the world champion, he is expected to win, I came third on the hurdles, I'm not expected to win. But it's the first time for 20 odd years the Americans had somebody on their job strap. Hmm. So, 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 so now he's got this guy on a job strap. And you know what it's like? Anyone can, can perform above, above themselves in any given scenario. Uh, he's getting a bat and he's supposed to be having a sort of a procession. He's now got someone on his job strap and he's, and, he, and he's thinking mechanically. And you know what it's like? If you've got a ball and you just chuck it, it gets to the point because you just chuck it. But if you get a ball and think, okay, Ball trajectory 45 degrees, and I think about the acceleration 0 to 70, release it now. It's all, I think, he, there's a lot of that for him, but he was all of a sudden placed in the situation, a little bit mechanical. I'm in his, I'm in his leap slipstream. I decide when I'm gonna go. He can't, he can't, he can't shake me off. It, it, was, it was in an impossible place. I was ready, we were ready. It was our time, and yeah. not Absolutely fantastic. So when you've got a team like that, that's, uh, that, that's reached its moment, uh, it's all happening in the right direction, it's all gone to plan, the strategy's been followed, everything's happening, we're on fire. When new people come into a team, so I'm now thinking in, in the business environment, you've already got a team that's bonded well together. How do we bring youngsters into a team and, and get their full potential out of them? That's a fabulous question. So Phil, the fact, fact is, we've all been, we were all youngsters once. So that, that, that team now that's, that's, that's solidified in history, we all came in at different times. Mm. It's really, really important to understand that this is now and it's not later on. And so you are always succession planning. You are always introducing new blood into the system. You are always aware that a business has a moment where it's highs and it's lows. And what you're trying to do on the S-curve is before the S-curve, introduce new blood so that rather than dropping all the way down, you whoop, yeah, and you, and, you, and, you, and, and you inject new blood so that the S-curve the is continually going up and not dropping down. So we don't wait for it to go pear-shaped before we bring in the... Yeah. You, 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 you bring new blood in while you are on your way up because they catch the culture like a virus. They understand it. So in that team, I remember vividly when Derek and Roger came into the team, 1986. They were, they, they, they were a new blood in 1986. I was part of the team that we spoke of right at the beginning of this call, which was um, Phil Brown, Todd Bennett, Gary Cook. And I was new blood in 83. Roger and Derek was new blood in 86, 87. And then... John was new blood in, 90, in 91. So you, you bring new blood in. And this is the thing. When you bring new blood into your team, it's really important that you don't shut down innovation. New blood come in to learn how to do stuff and they bring in new stuff that takes you to another dimension. And so that is vitally important, that you are listening to the new stuff that's coming in, that you're Prepare to shake your paradigm, shake your model. It's easy. Oh, good and old businesses die because they're stuck in the past. Right. That's, uh, I love this. Uh, we could talk all day, but I'm conscious of your time. So I'd like to kind of just wrap up where we, where we started. Uh, and in terms of bringing new blood into teams, I know something you're passionate about, uh, the C potential campaign. Mm -hmm. um, where you're quite eager that employers don't overlook people from perhaps a care background. Yes. Um, tell us a bit about that. 
Ooh, check out my man's been doing his research. Check out yeah, well done, Phil. Yes, so basically, it's, it's, it's my background, it's my backstory, and I love the idea that the government have got the seed potential campaign. And basically, what they're really looking for is it's easy to recruit people in our likeness. It's easy to recruit people from our own demographic. You know, I've done very, very well. So it's easy for me to go and see my friends, all my friends, and I only take people in my friend's circle and I hire their sons and their daughters. And I look for people that have got an Oxbridge background or got a, a university degree. See potential is about looking outside of, the, outside of the norm, maybe looking at people that might have a character background. Maybe look for somebody who's a little bit younger than your demographic. Maybe look for someone who's outside a different culture, a different custom, a different background, and allow that person in and allow and, and identify the potentials in, in them like a Scott McKenzie did for me. To look and see and say, okay, that I, I was looking for somebody in that job, but maybe actually I can see you here and I could nurture you there. And I, all of a sudden I can see I'm open up a marketing department in my business. Or I'm, look, I'm, I'm open up a, a, a property rental business in my business you know, look look for potential it's all around you mm. you know and i i for example do a lot of work with people who are from look off background but but the way i do it is not 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 that i mean i do work with people from look off background and in and in the in their societies and and charities but i do a lot of work with housing associations because in a housing association you have people from all sorts of walk, you know you have single parent families you have people from a looked after background. You have people who were, did well, got divorced, fallen in the hard times. And so I work with them to try to develop their potential and get them to see the best of themselves. If you come to one of my workshops, I'm not going to not really plug in it, but if you came to one of my workshops, you would see in there people who are really want to be plugged back into society and just need a helping hand. And they're really ready to work hard for you once they've been through our programs. They're potential all around. Yeah. Big part of the program, yeah. Fantastic. Chris, we uh, are finishing each of these interviews by asking our guests if they could set a challenge for the uh, IFAs and financial planners um, uh, watching this today. So if you're setting a challenge, what would, what would that be for them? Okay, so I'm going to again go right back to the beginning. I'm going to say to the IFA, now I've got on here my, uh, my, my it's an Apple Watch, but it could be anything, doesn't matter, any bit. Um, I'm going to half my time. I do an hour a day. You don't have to do that. But for the next 21 days, for the next 21 days, I'm going to challenge you half an hour of your day. First thing, go out for a run for 20 minutes. Run, walk, doesn't really matter. I'm saying get outside the house and walk around. If you can walk in 20 minutes, you can definitely walk. Oh, I don't know. Maybe you can't. I would expect to do a couple of miles. Maybe a mile. It, it doesn't matter how far. Pick somewhere that's 10 minutes away, walk there, walk back. Go and get a newspaper, walk back. When you do come back, before you have your cup of tea and stuff, I'm going to ask you to do build up to 20 press ups, 20 sit ups, 20 half squats. You know what half squat is? 20 half squats. Yeah, yeah. That's going to be five minutes. And then I will ask you for five minutes just to sit there and contemplate yourself, your day, your family, your friends. doesn't really matter what it is. And ask yourself who you're going to be today. Then you get into your day. Do that for 21 days and that will become a habit. And that habit will serve you the rest of your life. Some of your greatest ideas will pop up. In fact, when you're out walking and running for 20 minutes, you, you will come back and you want to, you can't wait to put down some notes. Mm. Just do that. Dedicate the half an hour to yourself, to your wellness, to your world. Fantastic. Chris, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering if you'd got your medal in your pocket and you delivered, uh, which was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, for everybody watching this, I hope you've enjoyed this. You'll have the opportunity at the end of this video to join a private group where you can take up Chris's challenge and you can feedback as to how you're getting on with it and you can get accountability partners as well. 
So in the meantime, Chris Akabusi, thank you very much for your time and great to see you today. Phil, thank you very much. Everybody listening, thank you very much. I wish you well on this wonderful sojourn called life. God bless you. All right.